Hello and welcome to today's REVIVE webinar by the Global Antibiotic Research and Development Partnership Guide P. My name is Astrid penz -Moore and I am hosting this webinar on clinical development of antimicrobials, phase one development changes. REVIVE is Guard P's education and outreach program. It aims to connect and support the antimicrobial R&D community by facilitating learning, sharing knowledge and connecting people. These webinars are part of our educational activities. All webinars, including the Q&A sessions, are recorded it can, and can be viewed within a few days after the live broadcast on our website. I encourage you all to visit the REVIVE website to stay up to date about our future webinars and also to watch the recordings of our previous webinars. We also develop other content, such as our antimicrobial viewpoint series, where leading experts of different aspects of AMR are sharing their knowledge and opinions. As always, today's presentation will be followed by a Q&A session. For this, you can submit your questions at any time during the webinar in the questions window in your webinar control panel, as shown on this slide. We will address your questions after the presentation and we will do our best to address as many questions as possible. Today's speaker is Markus Zeitlinger from the Medical University of Vienna and the webinar will be moderated by Markus Heep, who is the medical lead of the Guard P Solifludacin program. Welcome, Markus. I now hand over to you for a brief introduction of our speaker. Yeah, thank you, Astrid, uh, and I'm happy to welcome today's speaker. He, he has a very interesting uh, presentation, and and, and we will you want to have sufficient time for questions. So I just want to point out that Markus Seidlinger is a very well-known clinical pharmacologist working in Vienna and for us of particular interest is that he also is a regular invited expert for the EU, European Medicines Ag Agency, so the EMA, and actively involved in, in, in scientific advice procedures given by the agency. Uh, he's also involved in PKPD development and, and uh, in, in the ESCMIT working group. So, um, with much without further ado, uh, Marcus, can you start your presentation now? So, thank you very much, Marcus, for this extremely nice introduction, and I will do really my best to do this introduction justice. And um, I would also like, of course, to welcome. Uh, the whole audience and uh, all people from all over the world. Uh, good evening to some of you, good morning to others of you. And I will uh, try also to do my best to get you all on board. I know that there are really veterans in drug development online, but on the other hand, there are also students. So I put together a portfolio of uh, a lot of different directions of slides. Uh, and uh, I think at the end, we will have more than enough time to answer your questions. Um, yeah, as you can see, I have quite a long list of disclosure. Uh, that's, the reason is not that I get so much money from the pharmaceutical industry, unfortunately not, but uh, my department and I'm uh, really involved in drug development since uh, over 25 years. And with that, uh, of course, we do a lot of studies together with the pharmaceutical industry. First of all, I would like to set the scene a little bit broader and set all uh, the whole presentation a little bit into context. As you will recognize, I will focus the majority of my talk to uh, the European situation, simply because I'm um, more an expert for the European situation than for the FDA. Sometimes I will point out a little bit uh, different aspects for the FDA, but mostly I will focus on the European situation. And in Europe, if you have a novel antibiotic, actually you have four different possibilities to get this onto the market. The left one, the centralized pr progress or procedure is by far the most important nowadays if you have a novel drug. This will be controlled by the EMA. And actually the applicant will submit the dossier to the EMA and then uh, two member states will take care of this dossier 
and they will write a recommendation and then actually the EMA and the European Commission will have to decide on that. That's already different from uh, FDA to EMA. In the United States, the FDA will do directly the assessment. In Europe, it will be two reference member states, but unfortunately, you cannot decide who these member states will be. In addition, of course, you can go to a single member state doing a national progress, but then you only get approval for Austria, Germany, Italy, depending on where you go. Then uh, the last two are a little bit a mixture. The mutual recognition means it has been already approved, for example, in Germany. And Austria says, well, we trust what the people in Germany did, the assessors in Germany did, and we will accept this and will also allow approval in Austria with limited data, or with, not with limited data, with limited evaluation of the data, actually, because it is already approved in Germany. And the decentralized progress, this uh, is the case when you get uh, more countries at once, but not through a centralized procedure. And here you see actually where it's mandatory. And at the moment, it's not mandatory to go for a centralized progress when you have an antibiotic. It would be if you have an antiviral. It would be if you have HIV or oncology. But it's not mandatory at the moment for an antibiotic. However, if you have a generic antibiotic, then it would be mandatory. And we should keep this in mind because we will get back to generics later. These are the standard or schemes of drug development. So a company discovers a novel antibiotic, then you have some preclinical uh, development, usually some efficacy studies, preclinical safety studies, and then you go through the clinical development with classical phase one, two, and three studies, then you get registration, then perhaps some post-marketing approval. This is how it used to be, but nowadays all those phases are much more mixed together and I will try to uh, give you an outlook how this looks at the moment. Let's start for the definition for a phase one study. And when you look to Wikipedia, this is what you find for a phase one study. It means testing of a drug in healthy volunteers. And it means just 20 to 100 people, healthy volunteers, patients, whatever you have. Actually, I think this definition is completely wrong. And I will show you in a second that phase one studies are much, much more. Much, much more in three different dimensions. The first dimension is actually the aims of a phase one study. The aims are tolerability. So how good is it tolerated by an individual subject and how safe it is for the population to use this drug? Then pharmacokinetics and efficacy. And efficacy, this is really something that is special for antibiotics, because only for antibiotics you have such a close correlation between PK and PD that you can at least estimate what the efficacy of a drug could be based on target site exposure and based on susceptibility of the pathogens. I will get back to this later again. Then you have another dimension, and these are the stages of phase one. You have pre-approval stages, and post-approval stages. The pre-approval stages means the minimum requirement for approval. So you need to have some data, otherwise you won't get your drug approved. Sometimes pharmacokinetics is also the sole basis for approval. For example, if you go for an hybrid application or for a generic drug. Again, I will get back to this later. Post-approval, sometimes you will do studies in special population in special compartments you will do those optimization exercises and they could provide you the basis for an extension of the indication or for a so-called variation variation could be an extension of the indication variation could also be that you have another uh, formulation of your drug let's say subcutaneous instead of intravenous uh, or you simply have another dosage. All those would be type 1 or type 2 variations. And uh, usually, especially for type 2 variations, you need pharmacokinetic data. And then the last category in which you can divide uh, phase 1 studies is actually the, the real uh, setup of the study. So you have first demand studies. And this is usually what we understand when we talk about phase 1. But as you see, it's much more. And you will have single dose and multiple dose escalation studies. 
then you will investigate excretion and metabolism of your novel antibiotics, either by mass balance study or when you look into special populations uh, like, ex for example, renal or hepatic impairment, QTC studies, special PK studies, again in tissue pharmacokinetic sense, for example, drug drug interactions with other drugs, or if you uh, develop a combination, a fixed dose combination, like for a uh, beta lactamase inhibitor, for example, or a fixed dose combination for a TB drug, this would also require drug drug interaction studies. Let's start with tolerability. And tolerability always starts in the preclinic before we can move in the clinic. And for the FDA, you have, uh, as well as for uh, EMA, you have a very clear guideline, which is actually an ICH, so International Conference on Harmonization Guideline. What you need to do before you can dose a healthy volunteer or a patient. Usually, antibiotics are given rather for a short period of time, so up to two weeks exposure in two species, one must be rodent, one a non-rodent, is usually sufficient before you can uh, uh, initiate your first demand study. If you want to go to multiple dose, usually you would need uh, at least four weeks. This is actually not a much, not much data that you need for your first demand study. And it would be even lower if you go for a phase zero study. This would be a microdose study, either with carbon-14 or with uh, PET tracers. However, both ways, PET tracers and phase, and, uh, phase zero studies are usually, or are rather the exemption than the rule, I would say. Later on, you will need other studies. But why are those first studies so important for me as a principal investigator of a first demand study? And why do I actually want to see side effects in the animal? Well, it's very easy. In case I uh, note that in the animals, in the rat, for example, you have seen problems with the kidneys, of course, the target organ that I would be really interested in my health for volunteers would be the kidney, and I will do uh, kidney function tests every day. If I do not have any indication of toxicity in the animals, it's much more tricky for me actually to decide, can I increase the dose? Can I move on with the next cohort? Or do I have to stop? And on the other hand, of course, I want to define the no adverse event level, the no L, which is, gives me my starting dose. So this is the dose where you have seen absolutely nothing in the animals. And then you would go down to one tenth to one hundredth, depending on what kind of molecule you have. And this is actually the starting dose. Later on, you will meet much more data, and this really then depends on the final indication of your drug. Usually, for most antibiotics, you won't need any chronic toxicity studies. The exemption would be an anti-TB drug, which is given over six months or so. Then you also need chronic toxicity studies. You always will need reprotox studies. You always will need toxicokinetics. Otherwise, the drug will simply not be approved, but this is not necessary for your first demand studies. This is the workflow for a first demand study. And this brings me actually to one of the questions that all the pharmaceutical companies ask me when they, when they approach us, how long does a cohort take and how long will the, the whole study take? And it's pretty easy. Usually your cohort consists of uh, eight to 12 subjects when you go for a single ascending dose. When we have eight subjects, two of them usually receive uh, placebo and six of them receive the drug. Uh, and the first two you would dose on a separate day. They are called sentinel subjects, and the other ones you could uh, dose on a on on uh, a single other day, or you divide them into three or three. But actually, this is all possible in a week, I would say, depending on how long the follow-up of this is. Always a crucial part of this study will be the pharmacokinetic assessment. So after you have done this one week you can immediately go to the shipment procedure and ship this to a pharmacokinetic analysis lab. In between, or in parallel actually, my staff will start uh, entering all the data into CRFs and we will already start screening the next subjects. Based on the pharmacokinetics and the data, a DSMB, a data safety monitoring board, can decide if we can move on or not and then we can start our next cohort. One week, another week, potentially another week, which gives you actually a good estimate that we need two to three weeks for 
a dose uh, escalation regime between a single dose and the next single dose. Sometimes you can be a little bit faster, but it's always good to calculate the worst case scenario, especially if you talk to investors and uh, you have to define milestones. So if you calculate two to three weeks, uh, then you are on the safe side. And this is the design. You start with a dose, and the dose is based on your NOAL, the no adverse event level that you had in the animals. And then if those doses are safe, you can immediately continue after you have the DSMB meeting to the next cohort. Until all of a sudden you reach a level where you cannot uh, go higher, any higher with the dose, either because you have reached the dose limiting toxicity, which is usually defined in the protocol, what counts as a dose limiting toxicity signal, or you are already so high that you think your PKPD targets will be achieved. Either way, then you have your maximum tolerated or your maximum feasible dose. And based on that, you could do a couple of different possibilities or a couple of different things. Either you go for an additional cohort with elderly subjects, and I will again go back to this later on. Sometimes you would go for a cohort of female subjects if you would not include them from this beginning uh, in your in your mixture of, of uh, male and female subjects in the cohort. And of course, uh, you have the starting dose based on the maximum tolerated dose for your multiple ascending dose, because usually you want to give the antibiotics more than once. And your next dose uh, scheme will be a multiple ascending dose between seven days and 40 days, usually. Another question that is, uh, I would say it, it was very uncommon five years ago, but nowadays almost all companies ask if they can include QTC assessment in the first demand studies. And I have very mixed feelings regarding this, and I will show you why. So overall, I think at the end of the day, it's very important to have those data as early as possible. In particular, because regarding QTC, there is, at least in my opinion, not such a thing like a class effect. If you look into fluoroquinolones or macrolides in more detail, actually, then you see that for moxifloxacin or for sparfloxacin, you really have this signal. And for cyprofloxacin, actually, if you look into the data in a little bit more detail, there is no clear signal for this. And the same is true for macrolides. You have a QTC signal for erythromycin, you have none for acetromycin. So it's always good to have those data as early as possible. But of course, if you include this into your first demand study, you add complexity. So in principle, it is possible to add this. And actually, I would even recommend this when you have a preclinical signal to give you more or better idea, will you need a thorough QTC study or not? However, actually vice versa, the possibility for a waiver of a thorough QTC studies, and uh, that is what actually many companies of course seek because this would really save money. This is only possible when you have no preclinical signal. If you have a preclinical signal, the agencies will not give you this waiver, simply because in the first demand study, there is a lack of a positive control, Usually moxifloxacin is a positive control. You have many confounders. Imagine we have to approach the healthy volunteers every other minute, more or less, to ask them, how do you feel, to take another blood sample. All this is not the setting of a QTC study where you really have the subject in a very, very quiet, uh, controlled environment, really to have not any anything that would upset or would modify the, the heart rate. You also have technical challenges because in the first demand studies, of course, you need the safety ECGs. So you need the printouts uh, to immediately decide if it is safe to include other sub the next subjects. But then you also need the Holter ECGs. Otherwise, you cannot look into the thorough QTC stuff. So uh, you have to be very careful not to end up with two different machines on the health of volunteers because this adds simply too much, too much of uh, complexity. And look, taken together, all of this combination actually might slow down the performance of the study. Because when we add this to help a volunteer, we actually need at least two persons per volunteer. So then all of a sudden, one week per cohort might not be feasible any longer because it's simply too labor intensive and too much work to do for a single subject. Please keep this in mind. <laughs> 
is first in impatience possible? Well, in principle, it is possible. Usually, we have this uh, setting for highly toxic drugs, like pharmacology drugs. But you can also have this in case of urgency, like we have for the COVID situation, or whether healthcare volunteers are simply not predictable of your target population. Talking about COVID, I know that many companies at the moment also develop antivirus and antibiotics in this area. And that's a reason why I would like to give you a very brief outlook uh, what you can do in an accelerated way in the COVID-19 situation. You will find this figure or this cartoon online on the EMA webpage, but probably for some of you, those uh, different uh, termini doesn't make a lot of sense. And this is actually what is behind those termini. In Europe, you have two possibilities for application with limited data. Exceptional circumstances, actually you can already forget this again. This is really where you, the agency does not expect that you can provide relevant data at any time. For example, if you develop something against a biohazard or bioweapon like anthrax, it's simply impossible to do a randomized control study in this setting. So you would get an approval simply due to or based on preclinical data because it's unethical to do any clinical studies. This is exceptional circumstances, rarely the situation in Europe. Conditional marketing authorization means what it says. Conditional, this is not a full but it's a conditional marketing authorization. But you need actually a lot of data for this. You need to demonstrate that risk benefit is already positive, not in a pivotal study, but the data have to show into the right direction. It is likely that the applicant will have the data later on. This is the big difference to exceptional circumstances. It must be an unmet medical need. Well, COVID would be an unmet medical need at the moment. And it's better to have it at the moment. And this uh, risk outweighs the risk of the limited safety and efficacy information that you would have. Faster interaction with the agency is possible both for the FDA and for the EMA in this uh, situation. Uh, but when you look into a little bit more detail, this means uh, accelerated ass assessment. Usually the EMA has 210 days for assessment. For accelerated, it's 150 days, also quite a long period of time. But what you can have for COVID-19, you can have rapid scientific advice. This is what I do in my spare time at the moment for the companies. Uh, so uh, we get the dossier from the company and we have 14 days time to review this and to get back to the company. Usually scientific advice takes two months for, to get, uh, before we get back to the companies. And rolling review. So the EMA will look at the data as they come in. Usually you have to submit a final dossier and then they will start the review process. Now you can send them whatever you have. If you just have preclinical data, send it to them and they will have a look at them. You won't get an approval, but you save a little bit of time. Prime is just an uh, umbrella which expresses a couple of these different uh, topics. Not an approval at all is compassionate use. Compassionate use means that you can use the drug uh, it's not really an off-label use because off-label would mean it's already approved, but you can use the drug before it is approved. This is nothing that the, FD, that the EMA or the FDA allows actually. This uh, agency would give you just a recommendation and the National Content Authority decides if you can have a compassionate use program with the drug or not. In order to get this, usually those drugs are have proceeded pretty far in the development program. Usually they are in phase two or even in early phase three studies, then you get compassionate use. Named patient use, also nothing to do with the agency. In this case, not even with the national authorities. This is really the responsibility of the physician. The physician decides that this drug makes sense for a patient and it's his responsibility to do this or not. This is uh, relatively early in the development progress, sometimes the drug haven't even uh, entered any phase one studies before you have a name patient use. Pitfalls for the tolerability issue. Well, one obvious pitfall is of course a danger that you have always associated when you do studies in human subjects. We are not treating guinea pigs, we are treating healthy volunteers usually, and they are healthy when they come to our department and they have to leave it healthy. But you know all the that every 10 years or so you have a disaster. We had the bile disaster, this was uh, 2015. We had the De Janeiro disaster, which was 2002. 
And the disaster means that you have severe side effects, irreversible side effects, or even death in the health of volunteers. And this is what we had. So, of course, the agencies also require a lot of uh, safety measures in order to enable you to do the studies. Uh, and there is a guideline, of course, from the, from the EMA clearly saying that it is necessary to do this in specially equipped centers. You really have to have experience with this. You need an ICU, an intensive care backup facility. Otherwise, you're not allowed to do this in Europe. And it should be a single protocol at a single site. This is also very important. So for a first demand study, although it's sometimes a problem uh, regarding recruitment, you need a single site. Otherwise, uh, this is at least not, this is not a legal requirement, but this is not what usually an ethics committee would like to see, because again, it gives you more uncertainness between the different dosing steps. Another pitfall is, of course, uh, the amount of safety that you can generate for uh, a phase one study. And this is just a calculation exercise. Assume you want to detect an adverse event with an incidence of once in one in 100. So this is at the border of uh, what you will have in the SMPC. It's occasional to come on. In order to detect at least three such cases with a 95% confidence interval, so a statistical hypothesis, you would need 650 patients to really be certain to have three cases in there. To have one case, you need 300. And when you now go think back about the number of patients that you usually include in those phase one studies, 20 to 100, perhaps 150, then you usually will, would not be able to detect such adverse events. And here we start to talking about uh, rare side effects, very rare side effects, which is completely impossible. So please keep that in mind. A phase one study cannot give you the full safety profile. It can always only help you to define what is very common and what is uh, and uh, not necessarily what is very dangerous if you give the drug to a lot of people and to a lot of patients. Pharmacokinetics, the second big part of, of the game when you talk about pharmacokinetics of antimicrobial agents. Well, as I indicated, we have the situation that uh, we want to exceed a certain concentration. And usually this concentration should be in some relation to the MSC, to the minimal inhibitory concentration. But it shouldn't be too high because otherwise you have side effects. If you see something like that, this has nothing to do with the drug. This would be development of bacterial resistance. All of a sudden, the MSC is above the pharmacokinetic profile that you have, so your drug won't work, but this is not in your control. What is in your control is this situation. So you have an underexposure, which could be based on pharmacokinetics problem of your drug, or the other way around, this situation. So of course, it's still active. The bacteria will still die, but you have side effects potentially severe side effects where you would have to stop the treatment. Pharmacokinetics is always an interplay between absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. Absorption, of course, not for an intravenous drug, but for every other drug, so cutaneous or orally, you have this issue. And this is now when we get back to the elderly, because both absorption and all the other pharmacokinetics parameters can be very, very different, of course, in this population. Absorption can also be different when you uh, look into patients undergoing surgery. Uh, but in particular, distribution changes in the elderly because the body fat uh, increases, the muscle uh, mass uh, decreases, you have less extracellular fluid, and so on. Please keep in mind that you can divide the antibiotics into two large groups. And if you have this simple this simple allocation in mind, it also tells you actually a lot of regarding the studies that you will need. You have hydrophilic antibiotics and lipophilic antibiotics. And all this the hydrophilic antibiotics, they play a role when you talk about renal impairments. And the lipophilic antibiotics, they are usually metabolized by the liver, so they are more prone to drug drug interactions for the liver. What is also something that you should keep in mind is that you when you investigate the apparent volume of distribution, which you always will do in every pharmacokinetic first demand study, this is also a pitfall. These are just some numbers that you have for amoxicillin, isoniazid, and azithromycin. So amoxicillin 
at the volume of distribution of 0 0.2 liter per kilogram. The reason for this is it's very hydrophilic, so it only can distribute in the blood and into extracellular space of, of, uh, between the, the tissue. Estromycin penetrates into the cell. But actually, the volume, the parent volume of distribution of estromycin is 30 liter per kilogram. So, of course, all of you know that it's impossible that 30 liter can fit into one kilogram. And the reason for this appearance is simply this equation here. So we divide the dose by the concentration. So all that this number here actually is saying you is that the drug is not in the bloodstream. It's the concentration in the blood is very low and it's somewhere else. But this somewhere else cannot be discriminated simply from the volume of distribution and that's the reason why you need tissue pharmacokinetics and I will get back to this again. Um, another question that is frequently asked by the companies when they approach DMA. Uh, my compound is excreted to only 10% by the kidney. Do you need a study in patients with renal impairments or can I have a waiver? And the same is true of course for liver. It's not metabolized in vitro. Can EMA agree to a waiver? And the answer is yes, in principle, uh, EMA can agree, but then it's not possible that you exclude those subjects from your later pivotal study because you will need at least some data in order to have those data available for your POPPK models that you later on will have. An alternative would, of course, be a carbon-14 mass balance study as a proof of concept. And then you can demonstrate there that there is absolutely no metabolism and uh, nothing is excreted by the kidney. Then you can get a waiver for the special PK studies. Otherwise, they are a requirement and are, of course, also part of your phase one development. Probably the most important PK slide, and this is something that you always should keep in mind. This is the variability in a standard PK study that we did at my department where we gave uh, doxycycline in a very low concentration to healthy volunteers. Healthy volunteers, not any patients. And you see this threefold difference between the healthy volunteers at the fixed dose. This is simply the intra-individual variability that you will have on board when you give a drug orally with a limited bioavailability at least. And this is something that accumulates when you go to other populations, to elderly, to, more, to patients, to more severe patient settings, then you will get more and more and more variability. And this actually defines the sample size that you will need for all your PK studies. Food effect studies are very frequently actually included into first demand studies. Uh, the discussion is, can we use the same subject that we used for the safety also for uh, the food effect. My recommendation is do not do this because again, it adds complexity. You will always have a delay between uh, the fasting state and the fat state or vice versa. If you give uh, your drug always in the fat state and you want uh, to see how the PK influenced by the fasting state. And this could get you some problems when you look at the next slide. You, this is the design that you would like to have for any food interaction, drug interaction, actually every interaction study, because it's in a crossover this time. So subjects that start in group one, food for example, go over to uh, in phase two to the other group and the other way around. And that's what we call a sequence or a phase. And if you cannot control for the sequence of phase, you cannot rule out that you have a certain sequence effect. Uh, this is sorry, a slide later. Uh, this sequence effect is very important because if you go not, if you cannot achieve the baseline level again, then you will get a bias, and this bias must be uh, really avoided. In particular, if you have this high variability as seen here, and food effect, of course, is only relevant for oral drugs, so you will have a lot of heterogeneity. So I would really advise against uh, investigation of this in a non-randomized crossover way, because otherwise you will get bias into your setting. This plays, of course, a huge role when you talk about generics, drugs, or biosimilars. Biosimilars at the moment, we do not have so many, because uh, most of the drugs that we're talking about when we talk about antibiotics are small molecules, so they will fall into the regulation for generic or hybrid drugs,
when you try to make uh, Me2 drugs and to enter the market. Biosimilars are larger molecules, antibodies, but of course we will see them in a couple of years also for antibiotics. At the moment, when we talk about a generic drug or a hybrid application, generic means it's really absolutely the same. You have the same amount of drug, you have the same formulation, and uh, when it's an intravenous drug, actually you need no human study at all, no pharmacokinetic study at all. It simply is okay to perform in vitro quality studies, and if you have the same amount and the same pH and all the same uh, stability data, then you will get an approval. When you give the drug uh, subcutaneously, when you give the drug orally, you need a bioequivalent study. Hybrid is pretty similar to a variation, but a variation would mean that the company who has the original drug actually does the variation. Hybrid means that another company wants to do something different. So you would change the formulation, you would uh, change a little bit the dosage, perhaps you change even the indication. This would be a hybrid indication, but usually the background bone for every hybrid application again is a pharmacokinetic study. Standard pharmacokinetics parameters for bioequivalent studies are of course the 95 or the 90% confidence interval, which must fall between 80 and 125. Um, there is, I think, a lot of confusion what this actually means. And uh, since I know that also students are online, I would like to explain what this means. Often companies come or also physicians think that this would allow that uh, pharmacokinetic parameters are just 80% or 125% of the originator the mean pharmacokinetic parameters. This is, however, not true. So you would compare those two pharmacokinetic parameters, and if you see a difference like this, which is definitely less than 20%, and if these are the mean pharmacokinetic parameters, you could never statistically demonstrate that this is bioequivalent. The same is true for the second parameter, for the EOC. So the mean Actually, and we did this uh, in, a, in a large survey where we included uh, several hundred bioequivalent studies. The mean difference is usually one to two percent of the uh, bioequivalence uh, studies or of the generic drug compared to the originator. Otherwise, you would never get uh, approval of the drug because you cannot meet those confidence intervals. Because this is the reality that you have. You have a lot of different pharmacokinetic profiles, and you need to fall within this. 80 to 125 percent confidence interval uh, or 90 percent confidence interval uh, you have to, uh, to fall within this range otherwise you would not fall into this requirement so in a nutshell the pharmacokinetic profile has to be identical otherwise it's not possible to go for a um, generic application for a hybrid there might be an exemption when you can demonstrate that the toxicity for example is not CMAX driven there might be the possibility that you can have a higher CMAX with your hybrid drug than for the originator, but for a generic, this would not be possible. Extension of the margin is theoretically possible, but only if you can demonstrate two principles. The first one would be that you have a very high intra-individual variability, even if you give the originator drug two times, and you really have to demonstrate this in a crossover design or if you have a very, very broad therapeutic index, which usually antibiotics have not. So usually you would have to stick to this 80 to 125% uh, margin. And this is actually the slide that I, would, uh, that I wanted to show you before uh, regarding the phase effect. So it's really important that you come back to the initial situation after this end of the phase one. If you cannot come back to this situation because the half-life of your drug is too long, because you changed something in the metabolism of the drug, because the duration was too long, because uh, the first dose was in spring and the second dose was in summer because the half-life of the, of the drug was too long, then the situation is not the same anymore. And that's the reason why you would have to go for a crossover design and have to demonstrate that there is no sequence effect. If you have a sequence effect, this is a statistical problem. And with this also a regulatory and approval problem. So last part, efficacy. Based on PKPD, 
Um, as you know, there are not so many antibiotics in the pipeline and the regulators accepted this and tried to establish novel approval pathways that actually accelerate the development of novel antibiotics. And this is what the FDA says. So PKPD principles should be the backbone and could allow with less data, with less patients to get an approval. And of course, the basis of all those uh, considerations are these pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic considerations. These are the three common considerations. Is an antibiotic a concentration dependent antibiotic? So is it driven by CMAX over MSC? Is it AOC over MSC? Is it time of MSC driven? Most importantly, only the free fraction of a drug is active. That's the reason, and this was shown also by Kunin uh, 50 years ago, that's the reason why it is of tremendous importance that you really determine your uh, free fraction in vivo and in humans and not only in animals. This is just an example that you can uh, see for an old drug actually, what, it, what we just did last year at our department, which is the protein binding of clindamycin. And here you see how concentration dependent the protein binding is using two different approaches. One is the ultrafiltration and the other one is in vivo microdialysis, uh, which both have pro and cons. But this just shall give you an impression. If you just measure the concentration, let's say at the high end of the, con of the dose range, then you would of course get a completely false uh, AOC profile if you modify your total concentration simply by dividing the concentration with a certain factor that you have investigated at a certain time point here. So you really have to be very careful that you look into concentration dependence and you also have to be very careful regarding the techniques because some of the techniques and ultrafiltration does not work for all um, antibiotics, does not introduce a huge bias. This can easily lead to a false breakpoint later on. And this is what of course you want to, to avoid. Then of course, most antibiotics uh, have to work not inside the bloodstream, but inside of the tissue, what already Paul Ehrlich told us. And this is also what the EMA tells us when we look into PKPD principles, and there is a specific guideline for the PKPD principles of antibiotics. And what you can do with the PK data of uh, phase one. So of course, the advantage of phase one in healthy volunteers is that you get intensive PK data after single and multiple dose. And with that, you can build a very, very nice and uh, correct POPPK model. However, you always have to keep in mind that this POPPK model might not hold true for patients. And the second regulatory aspect that you should keep in mind is that, sorry, that the tissue PK should actually not be measured by tissue for monogenation, so not by biopsies. You can measure it in urine, you can measure it in ELF by uh, alveolar lavage, for example. You can measure it by microdialysis. This is the third technique that is mentioned, but you should not go uh, to biopsy. And this is actually the reason why uh, you shouldn't go to biopsy or the reason, this is just a pro and cons for the different techniques and I will skip this slide. Uh, but this is the reason why you shouldn't do biopsy if it can be avoided. Atrazomycin, a biopsy setting in patients, concentration in tonsils compared to plasma. And 14 means that it accumulates 14 folds in tissue compared to plasma, meaning a very, very good tissue penetration, actually what also was indicated by this high volume of distribution. Well, this is what happens. You have very high concentrations in the cells, you have an unknown concentration in the interstitial space fluid and you have a low concentration in the blood. And then you take the biopsy and you put it in the mixer. And if the concentration is really high in the cells, you get a very high or relatively high concentration in the average. When you use microdialysis, which gives you the concentration in the interstitial space fluid and which gives you the unbound fraction, so the fraction that is really active against a pathogen, then and again, look at acetomycin, then you see this data. This is a logarithmic slide uh, or scale. This is the concentration in leukocytes, which is hundredfold higher than the concentration in uh, sorry, 
200 fold higher perhaps than the concentration that you have in plasma. And this is the concentration, the unbound concentration that you have in tissue. So if you measure the concentration just in the, in the leukocytes or just in the tissue biopsy, then you will get a false high concentration. And actually the concentration that is interesting for you is the unbound concentration in plasma or the unbound concentration in the interstitial space fluid because this you need for your PKPD exercise. Otherwise you get wrong breakpoints. You can also combine, of course, techniques. This is what we did for uh, liver molin, which was recently approved by the FDA and by the EMA. So you can combine microdialysis, uh, the unbound fraction here in plasma, the unbound fraction here in microdialysis, with the concentration in bronchial alveolar alavash with ELF sampling in the same healthy volunteers. And then you get a pretty good impression how this drug behaves in, your, in the human body. And then, of course, you can model all those data. Again, a very interesting technique, but a technique that usually is not performed by the companies because it's very complicated uh, PET technique. This gives you an impression of the pharmacokinetics in all compartments in the human body at the same time. But of course, you have to radio label your compound. And this is what you usually would not need any longer later on in your development program. So it's very nice, but usually not what the companies do. Some pitfalls. Uh, a very important pitfall, I think, is when you look at the concentration in the epithelial lining fluid, you have a pretty similar situation than for azithromycin in blood. This is the concentration in plasma, this is the concentration in ELF, and this is the concentration in alveolar macrophages. Again, a logarithmic scale. And if you do this in an unexperienced center, and if you do not proceed the samples immediately, the alveolar macrophages will decrinolite, they will die, and then they will release the intracellular concentration, and you would get a false high concentration in the ELF. And again, this would lead to wrong breakpoints because you would overestimate the activity of your drug. Another pitfall, as the EMO already outlined, is if you rely only on data of uh, healthy volunteers, this could be a problem, in particular if you go to septic or a very severe setting later on. This is the difference of the tissue pharmacokinetics when you look at healthy volunteers with microdialysis, where you see actually an equilibration between the unbound fraction in serum and the unbound fraction in muscle, healthy volunteers. And then this is the difference uh, in, uh, in septic patients, logarithmic scale, all of a sudden, the concentration in tissue is manifold lower because the drug cannot penetrate so good into the tissue due to numerous reasons, which we can discuss later on if you'd like. Again, what I pointed out, the variability is always much higher. These are data obtained by ELF sampling. This is the variability of healthy volunteers for ELF sampling. This is the variability of the same drug in critically ill patients. So much more complexity for any POP-PK model that you would later on have. And are not even the regulators are 100% sure if you need both data. I think you should have both data. They have the volunteers for the initial planning of the dosage for the clinical studies, but later on for the confirmation of the breakpoints, you also need the data from the uh, critically ill patients because otherwise it's not predictive. A few words regard special designs, and unfortunately, those special designs that you might have heard, umbrella designs, basket trials, adaptive trials, they do not really uh, relate to first demand studies of antibiotics. So an umbrella design, this is actually from cancer drugs, where you have one type of cancer with different mutations, and you test three different drugs. This does not mean that you have different um, antibiotics in a certain study uh, and you can investigate them all in one uh, with one study. Basket trial is a similar or is the inverse. Uh, you have multiple types of cancer and you test it with one drug. Well what you could of course do you could have one uh, study one phase one study and this we have actually frequently where we say we want to investigate the pharmacokinetic of a drug not only in ELF, but you want also to investigate it in, uh, in ascites fluid, in urine, or in uh, satin S fluids, 
uh, so in cerebral spinal fluid or in other compartments. And this could be put into one kind of study. So this would be kind of a basket trial, if you like. And then you have those adaptive uh, platform trials. This is something that you really have to discuss with your local ethics committee if they would accept this for uh, a first demand study where you really can later on modify the dosage steps or what kind of information they need to allow you uh, increasing the dose for a certain level to the next level or from single ascending dose to multiple ascending dose. What you can do, and this again depends really on the National Competent Authority and uh, on the Ethics Committee, you can combine different questions in one protocol. And I tried to highlight this with, uh, with those color codes. So green means actually you can do this in the same subjects. Yellow means same subjects, but not optimal. And red means same protocol, but other subjects. So protein binding, investigation of this uh, concentration dependency of protein binding, this can be easily done in the first demand uh, dose escalation study. Absolutely no reason not to do this if you like. QTC study, as I indicated, it's not optimal because it adds complexity. Sometimes it could make sense. Food effect, easy in the same protocol that you submit to the ethics committee. I would not go for the same subject. Elderly, female subjects, I would prefer to have separate cohorts because it adds, in particular, if you mix females with males and you have such a small sample size of just eight subjects, imagine you have two females and the two females add up in the placebo group and you have six varum uh, male subjects, not what you would like from a statistical uh, aspect. So I would rather not go for this. Hepatic and renal impairment, not a problem to have this in the same subjects, uh, to, to have this in the same protocol, but not in the same subjects, obviously. And tissue PK, this is something that you can do uh, for some techniques, like for uh, ELS sampling, you cannot do this in the first demand study because you need, of course, sedation of the subjects and the sedation of the subjects could lead to adverse events. And you would not like to mix up the adverse events of the sedation with other adverse events that your drug might have. So summing up the pitfalls of this one study. So you do not get on too much information because you have limited number of subjects. So be careful if you extrapolate this later to many, many patients uh, in order to detect uh, rarer side effects, but also regarding the variability of the pharmacokinetics. This is the next point, other data representative for your target population in case the pharmacokinetic behavior is different or even the susceptibility is different because sometimes uh, fluoroquinolones, for example, show almost no central adverse events in young subjects. If you give this to elderly subjects, you have a lot of central uh, side effects, and this is a pharmacokinetic, uh, pharmacodynamic reason and not a pharmacokinetic. They are technically demanding, so you need special centers for this, and the wrong technique will give you the wrong answer. Remember the biopsy issue. Opportunities. It's much more than just the dose escalation. You can get much more information if you do a clever design. You can include target site PK protein binding very, very early, which gives you a lot of information for planning the subsequent studies. You can also do some exploration on special uh, populations early if you include the right subjects. Altogether, it will help you to guide the dose for the phase two, and this is probably the most important uh, topic when you talk about first demand studies or early PK studies for antibiotics, because this is really crucial for guiding all your development and all your indications. Does it make sense to go for urinary tract infection uh, if you have low concentrations of urine and health volunteers? And sometimes it's even the base for some modern forms of approval in particular, in those cases where it's very unlikely, then you can include a sufficient amount of, for example, highly resistant pathogens, then a, a basic approval just on PKPD principles might be possible. Yeah, uh, this is uh, the PKPD working group of, of uh, ESCMID, uh, which I'm currently have the honor to chair. So if you have any ideas, uh, you can approach us as a group. And this is my department. So if you want to do any collaborations, you're always 
very welcome to contact me and here's my email address. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Marcus, for this wonderful presentation and this really wide and solid foundation in, in our understanding of, of, of phase one. Of course, every listener has their own favorite or pet project or their, their development program and they have their own specific questions and uh, uh, so far there haven't been too many questions so uh, um, I invite everyone to 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 uh, to yeah open their 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 hearts and to 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 challenge us with the things because again every drug every new molecule has has their own uh, particular challenges so uh, the questions that I have Marcus maybe I, I I have to maybe rephrase the first a little bit so we investigate maximum pharmacokinetics profile and tolerability in phase one so you have a good phase one uh, dose escalation and and from what you know about MICs and target uh, predictions this drug should work and then you go into phase two and you maybe you you explore a dose that should work and another dose that's higher and that should work even better and you still see failures in that high dose um what are typical reasons for these high failures high dose failures well there are two possibilities two main possibility the first one is there is a pharmacokinetic difference usually the pharmacokinetic difference is not so large that it could explain a, a failure because then really the pharmacokinetics in your target population and usually the target population for phase two is not so severely ill uh, should, would be completely different than uh, to the healthy volunteers. One possibility would be that you haven't investigated the target site pharmacokinetics and actually although you know that your total concentration in plasma would be sufficient, the protein binding issue was neglected or the concentration or the penetration to your, to your target site is completely different. On top of that, you have the second possibility. The second possibility is the pharmacodynamic possibility. Let's assume your drug has to work, for example, in the urine, and let's assume your drug is very susceptible to acidic conditions, for example. In case you have in your population, uh, due to the pathogen that you have, a pathogen that uh, prefers an acidic condition, then for example, it could be the case that although the pharmacokinetics in the urine is fine, you have a high exposure level in the urine, it would not work because mm. you have a shift of the MSC and this has been demonstrated for a lot of drugs, for example, for fluoroquinolones, when you decrease the MSC from seven to five, that you have an almost hundredfold increase in the MSC, so reduction of the susceptibility. Hmm. Another possibility would be other inter interacting factors and uh, for example this is the, the, the deptomycin story where actually the pharmacokinetics in the lung was fine but the other factor was not known or was neglected and this was the surfactant. Surfactant interacts with some of antibiotic molecules, binds it and with that actually it uses the amount of antimicrobially active drug and then you can get a pharmacodynamic failure, although the pharmacokinetics actually is fine. Acidic mm -hmm. concentrations, or you can of course have a mixture of both. When you mm -hmm. talk about an abscess, uh, and you want to treat an uh, infection in abscess, then you can have a combination of both. Many drugs do not penetrate well into abscess, and then in addition, you can have a very acidic con, uh, condition in the abscess road. And in particular, if you talk about major abscesses, then you have a low concentration and you have an environment which binds perhaps your drug, inactivates your drug, and that's the reason then for failure. Right, and that's why we have to create phase two and phase three data in, in, in real life, because uh, uh, phase one can only carry you so far but uh, the better you do it the better uh, uh, you are prepared uh, next question here and I really invite more questions please otherwise I have to ask my own 
which are also interesting, but more to me. Uh, so, uh, Marcus, uh, can you kindly explain again uh, why not to measure tissue homogeneity, tissue homogeneity concentrations? Uh, you know, sometimes you get from preclinical uh, development, you get these uh, long tables of organ uh, concentrations from from uh, renal epinephritic to to brain concentrations from from small animals. Uh, how useless is that? Pretty much useless. Um, the problem is you need really the unbound fraction. It doesn't matter how you get the unbound fraction, but you need the unbound free fraction. Otherwise, your drug won't work. Or at least you cannot bridge it to the pharmacodynamic principles. And the pharmacodynamic principle is always your MIC. You will investigate usually the MIC in uh, a very well standardized situation and the standardized situation is Müller Hindenburg for example where you can investigate the the pharmacodynamic behavior for hundreds and thousands of different pathogens and then you want to compare this pharmacodynamic threshold with a certain concentration in the drug in the in the body but of course when you talk about Müller Hindenburg you have the unbound fraction and 100% of the concentration in miller hintenbrough is active to combat the pathogen. When you now look into what you have in a uh, tissue biopsy homogenate, then you have two problems. The first one is you have a mixture of bound and unbound fraction. So protein binding, it's not corrected for protein binding and it's also not corrected for binding to other uh, surfaces that you might have. Sometimes the drug will be localized and captured and phagolysosomes uh, sometimes uh, adhere to other membrane structures. And this is actually neglected when you uh, homogenate the tissue because then you really make it mixture, you have to make this mixture, otherwise you cannot do their analysis in an HPLC or in mass spect uh, machine. This is the first problem. The second problem is the micropharmacokinetic problem. So you want to know how really the pharmacokinetics is in your microenvironment. And for 90% of infections, this microenvironment is not localized in the cells. It's localized somewhere else. Either it's in a body fluid like urine, cerebrospinal fluid, or it's in the interstitial space fluid, so the space between the cells. And in case your drug accumulates in the cells and then you make a mixture out of all those different uh, compartments, you would get a false high average concentration. Mm -hmm. Also the other way around could be true. If you would do a tissue homogenate of a better lactam, this cannot penetrate into the cells. And if you then make a mixture out of this, actually your concentration would be too low. So you would underestimate the activity. All right. Um, can we just switch topics a bit? Uh, here's a question. Um, under current EMA guidelines, uh, as you said, sometimes it's helpful to have a maximum tolerated dose or uh, actually the, to, to reach a tox limit because then you can argue this is a limit and, and this has to be watched out in, in further development. So um, what, what, how do you how do you go to a maximum tolerated dose? Uh, what's what? What do you watch? Um, how do you design a trial to to uh, to find the last good dose group? Well, there are two possibilities. One possibility is you define the highest dose based on what you think you need, but of course you would not stop on this because, as we indicated, the pharmacokinetics might be different in the patients. So you would go one or two steps further to have a certain margin if this is tolerable in the human subject. So you assume that you want to have, I don't know, 100 mix per kill, but you go to 400 because you think this would give you this margin that you could later on use for less susceptible pathogens in case tissue pharmacokinetics is not so good, whatever. The other possibility is you have to stop because you have side effects. And for this, you have very strict 
stopping rules in your protocol mm -hmm. and they have to be predefined. And usually they are defined uh, per cohort and per subject. So you have certain stopping rules, they are defined per subject. So if you have a side effect that is so severe in a single subject, you have to stop the study, independent if this was just one in out of your eight subjects. And perhaps this was just really unlucky and, and you theoretically, you wouldn't have seen this a second time if you have a thousand other subjects, but still you have those stopping rules. This does not mean that it, the substance is dead, but you would have to approach the competent authorities again and explain them why you think that this one subject was such an outlier. Perhaps he has a genetic polymorphism, whatever you have. And mm. then you have the more strategic stopping rules. So this is bad luck. And then you have mm. the more strategic stopping rules where you say, okay, when you see uh, increased liver enzymes in two or three out of the six subjects that get verum, this is probably the, the upper limit. So this is not by chance, this is really a safety signal and uh, you shouldn't go any further. And what the stopping rules are, this is usually defined based on your preclinical data. Again, you would identify the target uh, organ of toxicity, could be long uh, QT, could be increased liver, could be uh, increased renal function parameters, whatever you have. And uh, if you want to include um, resistance prevention in these um, design discussions, how would you pre pre do that? <laughs> Um, that's a good question because usually the companies do not have this level of knowledge at this time mm. uh, based on their um, pharmacodynamic parameters and uh, so, so what, you, what you do during your drug development program is you investigate a couple of different aspects regarding the development of resistance. You have uh, uh, repeated throughput assays actually where you want to trigger a development of resistance but they are usually not so much depending on the concentration that you have. And then you have something like post-antibiotics effect or really uh, mutation prevention concentration. And this is something that the companies sometimes have at this stage. And in mm -hmm. case you see the, a certain activity, uh, but you know that you need to go higher in order to prevent development of resistance, then this would be, of course, also a justification for a higher dose level. To be honest, I've never seen this as a justification in, in any yeah. clinical protocol. Uh, interesting question here. Uh, if if you about infusion speed, so if you have you, uh, is there a flexibility in speeding up your infusion time after phase one? Um, yes, of course. Um, what, what you need is, uh, you need a, uh, usually you need a bridging exercise to do this. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about infusion, you always have a couple of different possibilities to control for the infusion. Um, either you stay with a certain fixed infusion time, which means when you go, so you always want to have, for, for example, an hour of infusion. Mm -hmm. So this means uh, when you, uh, and you want to have your drug at a certain concentration X. This mm -hmm. is usually what most companies have because they do not like to play around with different concentrations of your drugs because this has problems sometimes regarding stability and regarding yeah. uh, adherence to surfaces, to plastic surfaces. So most of the companies would go in, and actually I recommend them to go with a certain fixed concentration and to control- In the infusion the model. Yeah, and to control the amount via the infusion yeah. volume exactly. Yeah. And then of course you have two possibilities. You can either prolong the duration of the infusion when mm -hmm. you want to have more volume, or you can stay with a certain uh, duration for one hour, then you have to increase the infusion uh, speed. Mm -hmm. And if I can choose, I would like to go with a certain concentration which is defined and a defined duration of the infusion, because this is, the best uh, situation to predict the clinical situation later on, what you would like to have. Sometimes it's a problem because you end up with extremely high volumes uh, with, and it's not feasible to, to give that. In a the, in the single dose, you can do almost everything. Mm -hmm. In a multiple dose, it's a problem if you administer two or three liters a day. Yeah. Uh, and this sometimes would be, would be the result. Yeah. If you but later on yeah. want mm -hmm. to speed up, so most companies mm -hmm. 
wouldn't like to speed up. Uh, most uh, companies would like to prolong because they have a better luck time and to, would like to prolong mm -hmm. because they seem to have a better time over MSC. And that's this is not a That's the easier. As long as you have the stability data that it's stable, mm -hmm. then it's not a problem. Speeding up could be a problem and sometimes is a problem because you have more local side effects in, in your beans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, if you are, let's uh, again, we are we are really going across the the board here. If you are treating an intracellular pathogen, do you change where you want to assess drug levels in the organs? Yes. So, yeah, sure. Interstitial levels versus intracellular levels. What's your yeah. usual approach? So if you want to look into the intracellular levels, of course, this is completely different than uh, when you have a drug that is a bad luck time that is active uh, in the interstitial space fluid. So if you want to look into the intracellular levels, like you would like to have it for many NTDB drugs, for example, then you need the concentration in the cells. This is much more complicated. It's not so complicated to determine the concentration in the cells, because for this, you can simply uh, isolate leukocytes. This is the easiest way to get the relatively good concentration estimate in the cells. Not always are the leukocytes representative, of course, for all other cells, mm -hmm. but usually you would like to get an information on the leukocyte concentration because um, TB, of course, is an issue in the macrophages. And this uh, is then pretty much representative. However, this gives you the concentration in the cell, but again, just the average concentration in the cell. It's much more complicated if you want to know how much is active, because not every compartment in the cell is the same. And many drugs are inside the cellular compartments captured in phagolysosomes, which have a completely different environment. Mm. Now we talk mm. about a really low pH of one or two. Some of them are not stable anymore. So in a nutshell, you can get this information, you need to get the information. I would start with sampling the concentration in leukocytes. And of course, you can also do another approach, which is much better, but much more complicated. You can do a combined PET microdialysis study. So what you then do is, with PET, you measure the average in the tissue. You also know the concentration in the bloodstream, and you know the concentration in the interstitial space fluid. You can measure this with microdialysis. And then you can model what is really the concentration in tissue simply by subtracting PET, is the whole compartment. And from that, uh, you subtract the concentration in blood and, and in interstitial space fluid. But this requires a relatively complex model, of course. Yeah, and, and uh, you you can sometimes have uh, supportive data from from preclinical models of intracellular infection. They just bring things together to to understand uh, which which compartment of a cell. Uh, and we are getting into really small small units here. Interesting question. I think uh, looking into the future, we will see monobacterial antibiotics or even non-traditional antibiotics with, with, with no traditional MIC. In your EMA interactions, is there light at the end of the tunnel? Do we, do we, what can we, what can you expect there? Of course, I cannot talk about individual uh, yes. uh, dossiers. Yes. Um, I see more and more non-antibiotics uh, that are applying or that are developed in, the, in this direction. Seeing light at the end of the tunnel, it's, it's, it's a question since we haven't seen the, the clinical data for this. Of course, you have evergreens like bacteriophages, uh, you have different uh, kind of peptides. Um, I would see, think where we see the next uh, improvements will be the monoclonal antibodies because they have uh, proceeded pretty far and there we have also data from phase two and phase three. Um, I'm regarding antibacterial peptides, probably the next step, I would think bacteriophages are the most challenging ones. And yeah, and we are still talking about alternatives. And we're still talking about different ways of killing, but now coming to virulence modifiers. So not mm -hmm. killing, but just diverting. Uh, is there any hope? Um, 
of course there is there are two possibilities uh, you can uh, try to modify the virulence of the bacteria um, I'm not sure if I've seen any anything very very uh, convincing in, in, in this regard so, so there are other ideas you of course can also modify the host with gene therapies and there there are of course a, a lot of interesting ideas at least going on what we will see more and more and this also goes in the direction of modifying the host uh, non-traditional vaccines uh, so vaccines against really different kinds of bacteria and of antibiotics uh, like e coli like uh, staphylococci uh, which have i think a lot of potential uh, perhaps also some shortcomings but a lot of potential and here we will see a lot of uh, indirect and indirectly uh, virulence modification because they are of course targeting certain surface uh, structures of the pathogens and it might be uh, targeted not so much about regarding killing but uh, regarding mm -hmm. modification of the virulence mm -hmm. this is also at the moment what we see for for many anti-covid drugs actually they're not yeah. killing the, mm -hmm. the virus but modifying them yeah, and uh, we can only touch several of these things, and uh, I think we, we we can promise to the audience that they can approach you, then they can approach us with this this all these kinds of questions. We just again, these are just teasers for the really complicated uh, uh, um, areas. I have a very interesting, again, completely different topic. Uh, what's the latest on on monitoring nephrotoxicity? Is there a, biomarker some early signal that that beyond creatinine that can give you an early hint like an aminoglycoside comparative or a, the murapavadin yeah. story yeah there are different yeah you have a, a couple of different aspects regarding this so uh, there is no change i would say in the gold standard there are, of course, uh, biomarkers. With these biomarkers, you have two problems. One problem is uh, you should approach the you should approach the regulators if they will accept this kind of biomarkers. This is the first uh, this is the first problem or aspect. The second aspect is that usually they are not available in the clinical uh, setting later on because they are very. Mm -hmm. They're very experimental and you need to send your sample, I don't know, somewhere in the, in the world. So you can use them as stopping criteria in your dose escalation if you are really very concerned regarding renal toxicity in your healthy volunteer setting. Regarding, so can, can, you uh, name one? can you name one of those? Or? It's on my tongue. <laughs> but, uh, oh, no, 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 oh, sorry. I the name. <laughs> yeah. Actually, there, there are two. But if, there, if the respective person sends me an email, I, I have this on my laptop, but I've forgotten the names. Actually, there are two. Okay, so, so you mean bi uh, bi uh, biomarkers in plasma that, that can indicate early, early but, but the or hepatic damage, uh, renal damage, uh, and, and, and can help you with this uh, uh, go no go decisions. Uh, all right. Yeah, um, but it's, just, it's, just it's a lot of responsibility for, for a small biomarker to, to, to stop a development program, but uh, all right. Um, let me see what, what else do we have here. Uh, yeah, this was the nephrotoxicity before clinical trials. Uh, biofilms and phase one. Uh, how, why are there no testing? Oh, right, there are. Why are there no testing for efficacy of a new drug candidate in the presence of biofilm? Um, well, the problem is in, in phase one, usually you have helpful volunteers, so you won't have any biofilm there. Yeah. Uh, preclinical tests, of course, there are preclinical tests, and many drugs that approach the EMA uh, or many companies have some preclinical testings regarding biofilms. Mm -hmm. Again, for biofilms, you have the problem that you have not one standardized uh, assay available. So it really very much depends on the pathogen, which kind of assay you will use. Uh, you have, and at the moment, I'm talking about an assay which just investigates the impact of the unbound drug in miller hindenburg or in similar mm -hmm. medium on a biofilm. Here we're not talking about uh, when you add uh, protein, when you add serum, when you add antibodies. Uh, 
that have a lot of interaction. I'm not talking about an understanding is there a difference between a biofilm that is one day old and a biofilm that is seven day old. It's extremely complex. And I think that's the reason why many companies are very restrictive regarding this uh, setting, unless they target a specific indication for biofilm. And there are antibiotics that are specifically designed for treating biofilms or catheter infections. And of course, they have those data. Mm. So what, if, if, if there's a new molecule discovered and, and people start to do animal, uh, small animal experiments, when should they talk to a phase one pharmacologist? When should they start? Uh, are there large animals that can replace some of the human? Of course, it's again, again a big topic, but can can yeah. and and how often do these development plans actually need revision? Yeah. Um, so I think it's the earlier the better. At the moment, I'm in a couple of European consortia. Uh, where we have uh, startup companies and I think it's really very important to get in touch with a phase one center as early as possible because you need really, you always have the chicken egg problem. So uh, you need to know some clinical data in order to tailor the, your preclinical development and based on your preclinical development actually uh, questions for your clin clinical development arise. But of course, as soon as you know a little bit regarding the indication, for example, mm. let's, uh, let's think simply based regarding on your spectrum, yeah. you think yeah. in okay, the direction of, uh, of uh, pneumonia. Then mm. this is your, already your first decision step, which kind of animal models you need. And this is also your first uh, development step on later on in which direction your phase two uh, data will, will or uh, your phase two study will, will be. The phase one is between your preclinical data and your phase two. So this is the logical link. And the sooner you talk, I think to, and, and it, it's not necessary to talk to them every, every week or so, but I think uh, as soon as you have an idea regarding the direction in which you would like to develop your antibiotic, it makes sense to talk to a, to a phase one center. Mm -hmm. Can you, from your from your experience, uh, from from what you predicted on phase one dosing and what t turned out to be the the actual clinical dose, what was the biggest shift? The biggest shift is always it it, it doesn't work anymore, <laughs> so it should work and 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 it failed uh, later on in the in the clinics. Um, Usually, the biggest shift is, uh, or the, the relevant shift, are changes in the administration schemes. So that you move from uh, once a day to twice a day to prolonged infusion. And this is what you uh, see sometimes only if you have your first in men uh, data, because the half-lives could really behave completely different than in the animals. In particular, most antibiotics are not investigated in um, in monkeys. They are not using synomorphous mm -hmm. monkey or similar. So uh, sometimes the half-life is really a big surprise. Yeah. This then has to be, as, as soon as you have your first in human data, has to be modified. Yeah. Yeah. There's a s small comment on your slide about the liquinolones and the being lipophilic. Uh, you might, uh, so levofoxacin, uh, ciprofoxacin, in my book, they are also more watery than, than but, but what, what's the rationale to put them into the high protein yeah. bound, uh, the high volume? Because I, I, this slide summarizes the, the behavior in the body, and of course, they are mm -hmm. both hydrophilic and lipophilic in a sense, mm -hmm. uh, those, uh, but they behave. Uh, they belong better regarding the other characteristics, uh, at least in in the author's impression, because this was not my my uh, figure actually, but also in my impression to the to the uh, lipophilic. Of course, you always have these differences. Also, when you talk about uh, macrolides, uh, estromycin com behaves completely different uh, than the claritromycin regarding the pharmacokinetic profile. 
-hmm. but you have to make uh, some okay so we, we have not so much time uh, and I, I see here a, a large question coming coming along uh, about uh, liver transaminases uh, mm -hmm. so two questions uh, first uh, how much variability in pa in, in patient uh, types like BMI up to 30 body weight uh, up to 100 uh, what would you how much how realistic want to do how you uh, like like uh, only 70 kilo uh, 25 year old uh, healthy students or when do you start to to look into variability well the first question is of course do your dose regarding according to body weight or you have a fixed dose Let's assume mm -hmm. you have a fixed dose, because otherwise the picture is again different. Mm -hmm. If you have a fixed dose, uh, then we allow usually uh, healthy volunteers uh, between 60 and 90. So a relatively narrow uh, window, mm -hmm. again, in order to reduce the heterogeneity in this relatively small group in the in the first demand setting. And BMI-wise? Body mass? Uh, 30 is the upper limit. 30. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, transaminases. Um, what would be your uh, like a kill kill switch alarm signal? Uh, I think it still depends on the value of the drug overall. Uh, but yeah, so if, if for another for another tetracycline, it would be what what would, would be your so threshold? I, I I totally agree. So I think that just achieving high law in two patients out of 500 is not a reason to stop the development of an antibiotic if you need this antibiotic. Mm. Uh, in healthy volunteers, if you have two out of eight who have uh, a relevant increase of transaminases, this usually means that the drug is dead at least in, at this dose. Mm. So I see that we have now reached the end of Q&A and I really apologize. I had to look, uh, I, I think I skipped a few questions because I was so fascinated from your talk, Marcus. I will hand over to, to Astrid now and uh, uh, thanks for having me and uh, thanks for having Marcus. Thank you, Astrid. All right. Thank you very much, both of you, for sharing your your experience and for answering the questions. You're right, Markus, there were still a lot more questions and uh, we will try to um, summarize them in writing and maybe share with both of you. And I hope maybe, of course, I know you're very busy, but maybe you could uh, provide some written responses, which we will then share with the audience. So now I'm happy to quickly announce our next webinar, which is already next week. Uh, in this webinar, Anand Anand Kumar and Kamini, Kamini Valia will present on the challenges and opportunities for antimicrobial R&D in low and middle income countries. You can already register for this webinar on the Revive website. And we will also start to announce our uh, further webinars for the second half of this year very soon, so stay tuned. That's all from my side. Um, Again, thank you everybody for joining and for contributing with your questions. As always, I really hope it was interesting and useful for you and that you will join again in the future. And please feel free to share the word, um, spread the word and share our information. Thank you everybody and goodbye. <laughs>